it seemed the great escape. But what are the one of the privileges of being an actor is being exposed to not only time periods but subject matters that uh, aren't necessarily in your wheelhouse. And you know, as you all know, I'm sure Quentin is a true cinephile. And not just a cinephile; he knows almost equally as much about television and music. <laughs> so. I got to be exposed to an era of 1950s uh, you know, cowboy television, uh, sort of B and pulp um, cowboy movies, films that I never would have stopped to go see. But you know, he has this incredible respect for those films that equally as much as all the masterworks that we all you know, respect. And he's honed in on a lot of different actors to be the influence for this character from Eddie Byrne to Ty Harden. But there was one actor in particular named Ralph Meeker, and it was amazing to see his respect for an actor that I had never been exposed to, that most people historically might not remember, but going through their sort of filmography and their entire, um, you know, their entire life's work and looking at that in, with great respect and, 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 um, and an investigation into how you know, somebody like that might be forgotten in time. And that was really the, I think, the the basis of creating Rick, that he may not get all the roles he wants, but he still made his cinematic and television contribution, which is something that he may not realize himself. I was completely taken with Sharon Tate in that movie. If you've ever seen the movie, she gives a very funny performance. She plays this kind of klutzy secret agent. And she was, uh, uh, and she had, a, she had a, a gift as a light comedian that was actually pretty good. And it was even fun, fun watching her kind of um, uh, uh, execute these pratfalls and execute this kind of slapstick comedy. Well, as a, you know, a six-year-old, you love slaps, slapstick comedy. That's probably your favorite thing in the world. All right? So to see this cute girl actually just stumble and fall and trip and fall into mud and all this, never kind of, kind of lose her aplomb, it was completely charming. I was totally taken with her. And the movie actually ends with a great gag at the end that just ends the whole movie. That, yeah, yeah. It brought the house down. I'm telling you, I remember sitting at the Garfield Theater in uh, San Gabriel, and it brought the effing house down. Um, and I also did, I think, it was part of the inspiration for me writing uh, kind of the scene with Margot. Uh, I actually did exactly what, uh, what uh, Sharon does in the movie. When the film was out, oddly enough, the theater that I was at had a, had a patio similar to the room. And so I liked her so much that when me and my parents walked out of the theater, I went to the poster to look to see who that was. <laughs> And I looked at the, uh, the lobby cards, and they were the same lobby cards I used. And I was like, oh, who was Miss Carlson? <laughs> and they go, oh, it was Sharon Tate. Oh, OK, cool. You know, she's in Valley of the Dolls. And I had not seen Valley of the Dolls, but I knew of it. Everyone was talking about that movie at that time. And so uh, now, I think The Wrecking Crew is an ass nine movie. <laughs> it's really silly. And I'm actually a huge fan of the director, Phil Carlson. I just don't like that movie that much. I think it's a little silly. But she's just as charming and just as terrific as, as she ever was. And I'm also really, uh, as I always felt, but even, I even like the idea that we show the clip of the, of the movie in itself. So I, I, I like seeing Sharon Tate and Nancy Kwan, who I'm a huge Nancy Kwan fan too, to just pop up in the middle of the movie and have a fight scene choreographed by Bruce Lee. I think that's just a really lovely thing. I think on the day that we were shooting, Quentin told me a story about when a similar thing happened to him and he went to the Bruin and True Romance was playing and he, on a whim, kind of thought, well, I wrote the movie, can I go in for free? And it was such a sweet story, and um, I, I feel like with a lot of things in this film, that there's little memories of Quentin's interwoven throughout, which makes it feel so much more intimate and special and um, specific. I, of course, wasn't around to remember LA in 1969, but Quentin was, and as soon as I read the script, I felt transported because I was reading from his point of view what it was like to be there at that time, which made it feel more real and special to me. What they were playing on the radio, who, what songs were around, what you would drive past in order of what you would see. That level of specificity is um, such a gift and uh, like beyond that, there was little left to the imagination in just the creation of the world because Quentin doesn't rely on digital and CGI, it really is all there in front of you, which 
I have to say, being on sets these days, it, it doesn't really happen anymore. I mean, it happens to an extent, but only for the, you know, maybe three metres in front of you. After that, everything's green screen and someone's going to fix it later. It, I can't tell you what a joy it was, not just to be in that scene in the movie theatre and actually be at the Bruin and know that Quentin had a similar experience there, but to be in Hollywood in 1969, because it felt like I was in Hollywood in 1969 throughout this entire shoot, was one of the greatest joys of my career. I don't know if I'll ever walk onto a set and have that sort of, um, yeah, feel like I'm transported like that ever again. <laughs> Woo! <laughs>